let's talk for the next 40 minutes, let's talk about the Kotlin ecosystem and how to build libraries for the next 25 years. So why 25? Why this specific number? The reason is I started thinking about this talk four years ago, when I actually started working on libraries. Before that, I was an app developer. I was using a lot of libraries, but contributing, well, not so much, once in a while. And four years ago, it was 2020, and 2020 and 2020, Java was celebrating its 25th birthday. So whenever I picture a Java developer, I picture something like this. So some gentleman with a monocle and a mustache, with a lot of traditions. Uh, when you want a Java library, uh, you had 25 years to set up the best practices, and you know what to expect and how you like your libraries. When it comes to Kotlin, on the other hand, I was more or less picturing something like this. Back in 2020, Kotlin was a toddler, and uh, Kotlin was having the time of its life, uh, having a lot of fun and enjoying everything good in life. But what you cannot see in this picture at first sight, and it took me actually years to realize, is that this baby here just ate a full hand of sand. Like, you, you can see the little grain of sand here. And when you experiment with stuff, when you try stuff in life, sometimes it does not go very well. And for us, parents of Kotlin libraries, it's a stressful time because we want to experiment, we want our baby libraries to experiment with stuff, but we also don't want them to get intoxicated. So for the next 40 minutes, I want all of us to be caring parents of Kotlin libraries and see what we can do to make them achieve their full potential. I'm going to talk about the challenges of library development, then I will share my parenting tips, which you are very welcome to ignore because, you know, it's very personal. And then we'll take a look at how we can collectively build a better ecosystem for the next 25 years. Let's talk about challenges. And when I came into library development four years ago, it also came with a lot of questions. Uh, so this is a very small list of questions, actually. How do I name my project? Uh, how do I design my API? How do I publish? Where do I publish? Uh, how do I make it evolve? And most importantly, how do I make sure that I'm not breaking anything? Because I don't want to break anything. So it's a lot of questions. And uh, all of these questions, you know, they are mostly type 2 decisions. Like, it's the kind of stuff you really have to commit on. Because once you ship your library, it's going to be used by, I don't know, tens, hundreds, millions of users. And you have very limited ways to connect to these users, and they're going to expect that your library keeps working the same way as it used to be. So it's really, really hard to change your API once you have shipped it. And to make things worse, it's really, really easy to break it. There are actually three ways you can break your API. First one is a source breaking change. Let's imagine you have a very simple library with a simple hello function. Um, return takes a name, return the string. Well, the easiest way to make a source breaking change here is to change the parameter name in Kotlin. If you do this, everyone using your library and using name parameter, they will have to update all their call site. If not, well, they will see a big red error, which we never like. Another way to break your library is to do binary breaking changes. So in Kotlin, it's also very easy to make a binary breaking change. The easiest way is to add a new parameter. Let's say you want to say hello from a specific location, like Copenhagen, for an example. Here, I'm adding a default value for my parameter, so it means it's still source compatible. Don't have to recompile. But at runtime, I might be greeted with something like this, the infamous no such method error. And if we take a deeper look at this, this is happening because of transitive dependency. A typical case is your app uses two libraries, library A, library B. As long as both of them agree on the same version of your lib hello library here, 
it's all working fine. Lib A can call the grid function and everything goes really well. But if you try to increase lib B version, for an example, and lib B pulls a new version of your lib hello library that has a binary breaking change, well, then when lib A tries to call grid, it does not go really well. And this is when you have this runtime error. And well, source breaking changes are bad, but binary breaking changes are even worse because now uh, it's not like the user can do anything about it. Like if they want to fix this error, they have two choices. They can either fork lib A and maintain a fork and well, it's painful. Or they can go to lib A GitHub repository, open an issue and wait a couple of days, weeks, and then wait for a release. And it's also painful. So imagine that graph here with a lot of dependencies. It goes really bad really quick, and you end up in dependency hell. Obviously, you can break both source and binary compatibility at the same time. Uh, the easiest way is to just delete everything. <laughs> and there is a third way, actually, to break things, uh, which are behavior breaking changes. Uh, let's say you make a typo in hello, uh, you forget on L, well, or no, but you're a good developer, so you're going to fix it. Uh, so you're fixing it and shipping a new release, and then someone goes, oh no, you broke all my integration tests because I was expecting hello to be with a single L. Well, you got me uh, where I was heading. Building libraries is really hard. It's a lot of really hard decisions we have to make that are hard to change and easy to break. And no one really likes to make bad decisions, right? It makes us feel bad. So your typical library maintainer at the end of the day might look like this. A uh, bit, um, so many issues, like issue piling up and everything. But the good news is, because it's hard, it's also fun. Uh, if you're like me, you like solving problems. Uh, I love to say that uh, life is about solving problems. And if you don't have any problem, it probably means that you are dead. <laughs> uh, so uh, library development gives us a lot of opportunity to solve a lot of very interesting problems. And um, most importantly, we can do so by sharing best practices, what I'm doing here, uh, design for evolution. And if you get lucky, you can even get to experiment and try stuff with your libraries without making too many people angry at you. So now I'm going to share a few of my very personal tips uh, that helped me uh, be a little bit less stressful when it comes to making decisions. We are going to talk about API design, publishing, evolution. So it's a lot of things. But I want first to talk about something that is a bit more opinionated. And this thing is naming, of course. I have only one advice there, which is use good names. <laughs> and, you know, a good name, uh, I still think, like, of course, it's very personal, but I still think there are some um, common characteristics. Usually, you want your name to tell a story. You want your name to be easy to remember and show how your library is unique, what is in unique in your library. You also want a, good, a name that is easy to pronounce in multiple languages. This is uh, even better. And you might, but might not, want a name that starts with a K. I don't know, it's up, up, up for decisions. So you can go the very descriptive route. If you, say, wanted to build a new uh, build system using YAML, uh, you could uh, create a YAML parser and name it Kotlin YAML parser. Not a huge fan of this, uh, because if you go, if you want to buy a desk uh, for your home office, you shouldn't go to uh, cheapfurniture.com, right? Uh, you go to ikea.com. Uh, so similarly, as soon as you use Kotlin YAML parser, like, doesn't tell anything about your story, uh, about your library, sorry. If your people find you from your library, well, they know it's a YAML parser, so you just lost an opportunity to tell something. So it's time to put your marketer, marketing hat on and be really creative. Uh, so maybe you can call it yams because you love sweet potatoes. Or maybe yak because it's a, it's a cute animal and also because it's a no yak shaving library or something like this. 
Or maybe you can call it pancake because you have a, name, a cat named Pancakes. I'm not saying these are awesome names, but at least they will give a hook, and next time you come to KotlinConf, uh, you will be able to you know, start a conversation with someone about the library. Now, uh, let's talk about the real stuff, API design. And here I'm going to tell you the exact opposite. Uh, so you can put your marketing hat aside, and when it comes to API design, you can be as boring as you want, and copying is actually the best thing you can do, because you know the best practices are shared, and the more we use the same patterns, the less we have to learn about them, and the easier it is to recognize them. So what I'm going to do next is show you a few of the best example of APIs that I found in the ecosystem and that I hope you can reuse. First one is obviously extension functions. I, I love them in uh, Kotlin. Uh, this is well, one of the first things that I, I used in Kotlin. This is an example from OKIO. You can use them on types that you do not own, like the file type here. And they, the nice thing about them is that they do not break your typing flow. You can just keep adding and adding. You can also add them on types that you do not own, uh, that you do own, sorry, like source. And I also like to do that because it makes a clear separation between uh, what is core in your class and what is not. Another way to think about it is you have uh, classes for your data and then you have extension functions for your, your code. Distant cousin to the extension functions are the factory functions. Uh, here it, it's, for example, how to get an interesting URL from a, a Kator HTTP client. So you would expect HTTP client here to be a constructor. Well, it's not. You have a hint because it's a bit uh, in italic. But it's actually just a plain function with a, you know, a, a uppercase a first character, which is allowed by the Kotlin coding conventions. And it's a function that does a lot of things, calls the primary constructor, and then returns the client. It's also very useful in Kotlin multi-platform, for example, uh, to remove this expect, uh, actu actu expect actual classes, sorry. So instead of having an expect class, you can just define an interface and then have a function that returns an implementation of this interface. Next up are sealed classes. Sealed classes are awesome. This is an example from Kotlin X serialization. Makes it clear uh, to the caller what can be a JSON element, it can only be a JSON array, a JSON object, or a JSON primitive, and nothing else. One thing to keep in mind if you're designing a Kotlin library is that uh, it comes with caveats, and it's really difficult to add a new subclass to an existing sealed class. If JSON were to introduce a JSON pair, for an example, it's, I don't think it's going to, but it's a source-breaking change now, because all your users have to update their code. In terms of managing resource, the API I like the most is the API that does not exist. So if you can manage resource automatically by using either garbage collection or just timeouts, stuff like this. But if you do have to manage resources, OKIO has this nice use block that makes sure that everything is released automatically. So it defines the closable interfaces, uh, interface, sorry, and then uh, on everything that needs to be closed, you can use use, and then make sure it's all good. It's actually becoming stable in Kotlin stdlib version 2, so now you don't even need OKIO, and you have a multi-platform way to use auto-closable. Another one of my favorites uh, is value classes. If you've been in the field for a while, uh, you've probably done that before. I, I plead guilty of doing that a bunch. Uh, you just have a parameter that is a timeout, uh, a long, what is a long millisecond, years, carrots, I don't know. Uh, you can do things a little bit better by using a name parameter, and then it's milliseconds, slightly better. You can do this slightly better using time unit. But value classes is the best of both worlds. You get both uh, type safety and also the performance of using the raw type under the hood. 
And finally, my favorite one, I don't know, Builder DSL. Uh, so here is an example from Ktor for creating an embedded, an, a, a server that returns hello world to the main path. If you were to do the same in using Builder, it would look something like this. And I say it's my favorite because you know, I have kind of mixed feelings with the Builder DSL. Of course, it's a lot shorter, but uh, discoverability is a bit different. Like usually, I just type and then I have autocomplete when I put a dot. With the Builder DSL, I actually need to use another shortcut, so I find it a bit less intuitive. And also, this obviously doesn't work with Java. Which brings us to the big question, should you support Java? And should you make your APIs Java friendly in 2024? And uh, to be honest, uh, I don't have the answer for you today, sorry. So I'm, I'm going to use the It Depends card here. On the one hand, you have uh, Java compatibility, which has a, a huge user base and uh, a lot of existing users. And Kotlin comes with a lot of tools to work better with Java interoper interoperability, like GVM name, GVM static, GVM, GVM overloads. But I found that it's really hard to uh, do both at the same time a very nice Java-friendly API and a Kotlin-friendly API. And if you keep the compatibility with Java, well, then you lose a bunch of stuff, like the DSL I was showing before. Like, it's really hard to do both at the same time. And most importantly, like, do you want to do coroutines or compose? Like, this is never going to work with Java. So my advice there would be, well, if you have an existing library in Java and uh, it's working well, you're porting it to Kotlin, probably you want to keep the compatibility. If it's a new library, maybe it's a comp computational library like a parser or MAT library, and then it's fine to use Java, it's even better. But if not, then just go full Kotlin and use all the language features of Kotlin. Everything I shared, and uh, I mean, most of the things I've shared, you can find them in the library author's guideline, which are uh, released by JetBrains. Uh, you can go to this uh, URL here. The nice thing about it is that it's also a GitHub repository that has discussions enabled. So if you have questions, uh, stuff that works or stuff that doesn't work, stuff you're wondering how to do, this is a really good forum to have those discussions and make sure that we agree on where to build libraries. Once you have your libraries built and you are happy about the design, you want to publish it. This is actually one of my favorite parts. I spent a lot of time uh, backshading uh, various publishing APIs. And to tell the story about publishing, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. Do you remember this picture? Three years ago, uh, this was the sun setting of uh, J Center. <laughs> a big moment in the, in the ecosystem because it meant like uh, we, one of the main repositories we could use to upload libraries was not available anymore. At the end of the day, I see it as a positive change for the ecosystem because now we have Maven Central as the, the source of truth for the vast majority of the Kotlin ecosystem. What is Maven Central? Uh, it's a repository to host libraries using the Maven repository layout. What is a Maven repository layout? It's a lot of words to say it's a bunch of files uh, and subdirectories. You can do so in your local file system, and uh, it's really the same. There is nothing magic. The Maven repository layout was introduced by Maven, the build tool, in, the, in its version 2. So fun fact, if you see M2, this is because it was made by Maven version 2. You know, when you do Maven local dot M2, something like this, this is where it's coming from. But today, Maven Central doesn't have a lot of uh, relation to Maven, like they are very loosely related. Maven Central is hosted by a company named Sonatype that is doing um, supply chain management. And Maven Central is really awesome. Maven Central is free. It's completely immutable. So you can use something on Maven Central and make sure that it's never going to move. Like this is really the 
Arctic vault of the world Kotlin ecosystem. If you follow the NPM ecosystem, you might have heard of the, I think it was the everywhere package uh, meltdown that came up a couple of months ago. Uh, this will never happen in the Kotlin ecosystem, and we are luck very lucky to have all of this. Maven Central also does a bunch of other stuff, like verifying that you do not impersonate other libraries and so on. So as a consumer, Maven Central is really awesome. As a publisher, well, <laughs> it's a bit of a different story. Uh, if you created your account in 2020, you might have been greeted with something like this called Nexus. What the hell is Nexus? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it took me years to understand that it's the product from Sonotype that is actually the technology that hosts uh, Maven Central. And in 2021, when G-Center went down, uh, Maven Central got a lot more traffic, and so they introduced a new API called S001. So now you had two versions of the same UI depending when you created your account. But anyways, uh, let's say you wanted to publish something, uh, you would call gradleu.publish all publication to Maven Central, and you would get a nice staging repo like this which you would then close by hitting the close button here. And then a bunch of things would happen, a bunch of rules. And once this is closed, you could actually hit release and wait anywhere between 15 minutes and several hours for your library to be on Maven Central. So this is all for the good, uh, because during that time, uh, what Maven Central is doing is that it verifies all your libraries, have checksum and signatures, so your consumers can verify uh, they do not have been tampered with. Verify the metadata, like name and description. License is very important. You do not want uh, your proprietary software to be tainted by some GPL, or at least you want to be aware of it. And finally, sources and Java doc jar. Something that's important to note here is that you can send empty javadoc and sources jar. This is perfectly fine, so you can release closed source software on Maven Central, and this is working well. I recommend that you still ship the sources, because this is what the ID is using to actually navigate to the source, so be better ship it like we, we like it when there is, there is, there is sources. Anyways, fast forward to 2024. And there is a new UI. Looks good, right? It's a lot better. <laughs> uh, but it comes with caveat. Uh, it's, the publishing API is completely different. Uh, this one has no snapshots. So if you were publishing your snapshot on uh, Maven Central before, you cannot do any more with the new API. And no uh, stats yet. Um, so at the end of the day, and yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, this is all in addition to the previous things. So if you have three different projects that you created at three different times, you might have to log in on three different platforms. To add to that, all the plugins in the ecosystem have different ways to handle publication. Uh, if you're doing Kotlin GVM, you have to do most of the stuff yourself using a bunch of uh, Gradle logic. So creating the publication, adding sources, adding jars, adding, adding javadoc, and so on. If you're doing Android, well, Android has nice APIs and will create the publication for you if you tell it to create a single variant. And if you're doing Kotlin multi-platform, you have nothing to do. Uh, it's doing everything for you. So at the end of the day, you have three different systems, a lot of different publishing APIs. You have three different plugins, not even talking about the other ones, like Java Gradle plugin and so on. And a lot of different options, like the complexity matrix increases. So my recommendation here would be uh, to use the Gradle Maven Publish plugin. It's really awesome, except for one thing. Anyone? The name. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I can never uh, remember the order of the different names here. Uh, it's Gradle Maven Publish. So with your permission, I'm going to call it Vanitex. And uh, it's a Gradle plugin, and it does everything for you. It comes with really good defaults. 
And it even does uh, stuff like creating staging repositories and also releasing from the command line automatically. So really, uh, if you are new to publishing, use that and it will save you a lot of headaches. All right, so now you have your library published. Uh, it's all out in the world and you get feedback. And with feedback, you want to evolve your library. So how do you do this? Well, you typically update the version. And to do that, uh, we have a nice tool called uh, semantic versioning. Uh, we've all been there. We start with a pre-release version, 0.x.y. something. Then we do our big 1.0 release, and then patches and minor updates, then alpha, beta, rc, and big 2.0 release, and so on, and the cycle goes on. In front of all these versions, well, you have a list of different expectations, anywhere from, well, this is really super experimental and I broke everything last night, all the way up to I'm going to uh, maintain this long-term Java 8 style uh, forever. And for pre-release, it's pretty obvious that uh, you should not have too many expectations there. Uh, for long-term support, well, it's also very clear that uh, you can use them without any doubts. For the alpha, though, it's not very clear. Like, what does alpha mean? Does it, does it mean uh, you should not use it and it's very experimental? Or does it mean it's almost shipped, like we even have documentation, but remember, we do not want to commit to the API because we still want to keep the possibility to change it based on feedback. So you have this nice rainbow of all possibilities. And my advice there would be to really document uh, what your alphas is, are doing and the stability levels of all your different versions. Because most of the time, it's OK to use alphas in production. If you are an app developer in the room, like the best thing you can do for your libraries and for the ecosystem is to use alphas. Uh, this way, the ecosystem can move forward and make sure that we do not ship binary breaking changes uh, too early. Kotlin, by the way, makes a, a very good job at this. I thought I had the link there, but um, you can go to, I think it's the name, stability of components, and you have all the different stabilities of the Kotlin libraries. One thing to note is you can actually do major version without breaking changes, with a little trick that consists in changing the package name and may even group ID. If you change anything, well, you're not breaking anything again. You're just changing breaking changes into addition, and it's all brand new. Of course, like everything, it's a trade-off. Uh, you're losing a bit of tooling. For example, Renovate will not be able to tell you that there is a new version if you change the group ID. There are ways to mitigate that. For an example, you can release a last artifact with a lot of deprecation that will redirect to the new artifact. But it also means your user have to change everything in their code base, which is, always comes with friction. But if you are a library that is used transitively a lot, uh, it's definitely worth doing that. So this is for shipping new version of your whole library, like big monolith. But with Kotlin, we can do even better we can ship new version of symbols. Like We can actually have tools to handle the stability of individual functions and properties. The main one is requires opt-in. Um, you can make an annotation, uh, requires opt-in, and then when you put it on your code, it means everyone will have to either opt-in the annotation or propagate it to the caller. So if you do opt-in, uh, well, it says what it says. Uh, you should never do that if you are a library author because uh, it hides actually the fact that it's uh, experimental uh, behind your API. But it's very nice uh, for library authors like us, right? Uh, it's, it's a dream. We, can, we get to experiment and toy with everything, and uh, we get to change everything we want. Is it? 
In real life scenarios, what happens is that uh, in a lot of apps, and you might have seen that before, uh, everyone just opt-ins everything, and you end up in a situation where everything is opt-in. And if everything is opt-in, is it still experimental? Well, it depends. Um, my take here is that it is still a useful, a useful tool. Uh, it, I, I see it really as a marker of if you are a library author, never depend on some opt-in symbol. This way, we do not have this transitive dependency L issue. And if you are an app developer, it's fine to use. And if all your app developers, users use it at the end of the day, you might have to go through deprecation cycles, but at least you avoid the dependency hell. Second tool you have at your disposal is deprecated. Uh, we know this one quite well. It's uh, really good, and I love it when the ID does everything for me. Here you have uh, a function, uh, our grid function. Let's say you want to specify the local, and you want that to be a conscious choice from the user. Well, you can add a new overload and uh, add the replace with so that whenever someone goes into the ID, they will get something like this and they will just click command enter and automatically get the stuff replaced. So this is pretty cool. I, I don't know if a lot of languages have that, but I love it. Other thing you can do with deprecated is deprecate as an error. This is the next step. Uh, if you gave enough notice with warning, you can say to everyone that now it's time to really do something about it. Uh, like you cannot ignore this anymore, and it's time to update your code. You can also use it as a hint that some function is not available. This here is an example from Coroutines library. If you're coming from Eric Java world, you might expect a function called subscribe on. Well, there is no subscribe on in coroutines, but there is a flow on. So if someone tries to use subscribe on, they will get a nice warning, actually an error in the IDE, telling, telling them to use flow on. The other thing you can do with deprecated is mark a symbol as hidden. This is the last step. It's not showing up in uh, autocomplete anymore, but it's still there in your binary for binary compatibility. This is an example from date time. And with all of that, we have a very nice deprecation cycle, uh, where you start with this, your symbol opt-in, then it goes to stable, all the deprecation, and then at the end of the day, you remove it. If you really need to, or you can keep it forever, this, this works as well. So this is for evolving your symbols, uh, like consciously. But you don't want to evolve your symbols by mistake. And in order to avoid mistake, there's a very nice tool called Binary Compatibility Validator. And because, as you guessed, I love short names, I will call it BCV. But actually, it should be called BFF. Like this tool here is your best friend forever. If you are a library author, uh, use it. It's really awesome. What does it do? It tracks your public ABI, so the binary uh, interface of your library. And it comes with two Gradle tasks. So it's a Gradle plugin. You enable it with, um, well, just one line, really. It comes with API dump and API uh, check. API dump takes all your symbols and dubs the, the signature in a file. And API check checks that nothing changed. So let's do that with our library. If we take our um, earlier library, just a single function, and we call API dump here, we get a text file called, I think it's .API, uh, with all the signatures of all our functions, which is just one. So far so good. You can commit this text file in your repository and have it as a reference of your ABI. Now we are doing our source breaking change, uh, changing a parameter name. And now it's not name, it's nickname, but remember, it's a source breaking change, not binary. So if we call API check, we expect this to pass, right? And it's passing. So, so far, so good. It's not binary breaking, this is only source breaking. Let's take it one step further and do a binary breaking change. So as I told before, use adding a new parameter to a function. And let's call API check, and 
hooray, it fails. Uh, this is what we expected because we actually removed a function by adding a parameter. We removed the function with a single parameter. So what's really nice about this and what I love about BCV is that it integrates with your CI really, really well. Because you commit the dump in your source re repository, you have it as part of each PR. And if someone makes a pull request that removes the symbol, well, uh, you can comment and make sure with your team that this was an expected change. If we take this a bit further and we do another change, like adding a new function here, this is a backward compatible change, right? This is just adding something. So if we call API check, well, we logically expect this uh, to pass. But if you do, well, it does not pass. And it does not pass because if you remember at the beginning, I said API check, check that the ABI did not change. So what BCV does is that it just checks for changes. It does not know anything about backward compatibility or breaking changes. So you have to do the due diligence of monitoring your dump and taking the decision accordingly. Since the latest betas, uh, BCV supports Kalib. Uh, there was a talk this morning about Kalib, uh, which I strongly recommend you to watch. So you can enable Kalib support with a bunch of like Gradle file and have BCV work for both GVM and all the other platforms. And I will terminate this section with a small outtake. Like, uh, I don't know if you heard about explicit API. Explicit API is this thing uh, in your Gradle builds where you say, I'm building a library, so uh, I want to be explicit about the return value of my function and also their visibility modifier. So if you forget to put public, uh, IntelliJ is going to scream at you and say, you should put a visibility modifier. And then you put it and then IntelliJ uh, shuts up. But my point is, because you have everything using BCV, you already scan uh, your dump and you pay attention, you have a single place where all your API is dumped and where you monitor for all the change. So is this needed? I think not. Uh, uh, change my mind. I'm here until tomorrow, so I'm really happy to discuss this over beers. Um, but since I'm starting using BCV, I do not use this anymore. So anyways, we've gone a long way uh, from the early days of Kotlin, and in the last four years, we've seen BCV, uh, like best friend forever, a best tool to keep your API in check. We've migrated most of the Kotlin ecosystem away from G-Center, and the community step up to provide us with good tools to make the publishing. And now we have, since last year, last Kotlin Conf, we have library guidelines which provide some guidance and a place for us to discuss about the best practices. So what next? What can we expect more? And for this, I'd like to talk about the elephant in the room, which is not Gradle. <laughs> uh, error handling. Um, and for that, about error handling, I want to show a scary picture, which is this one. Uh, it's a lot of text here. Well, I wanted to show this one for two reasons. Uh, it showcases the Google SDK index, which is a tool where if your library is used on Android, uh, Google will tell you all the crashes that happen in the wild. So it gives you a lot of uh, insights about uh, what's happening in your library. And here you can see all the crashes from Apollo. So it's a bit scary on the big screen. But what I want to highlight is that they're all the same. Uh, it's all network exception, and this is all happening because, well, when there is a network exception, Apollo uh, just throws an exception. And whenever you throw something, remember Kotlin doesn't have checked exceptions, so, well, it's almost like we lose all the type safety. So there are solutions. Uh, I read this article from uh, Roman Elizarov multiple times, and if I sum it up a bit uh, correctly, Programming errors are okay to throw, like if you have an OOM or null pointer exception, this is something you cannot expect, so it's okay to throw there. But for everything else, uh, we should use types because we want the compiler to like, give us some confidence about our programs. 
But what types should we use? Should we use the Kotlin result or like Arrow Isa or one of the multiple community implementation or maybe even the Arrow Rise DSL or maybe build our own? And I'm really happy that I came to this Kotlin conf because it was mentioned uh, a couple of times, I, I think actually just earlier, a uh, couple of sessions back. Uh, looks like the Kotlin team is uh, hard on the problem and uh, looking into union types. So the future looks bright there. And I'm looking forward to see better solutions for handling errors. And one last slide about uh, the elephant in the room, which is Gradle. <laughs> I had to do it. I, I love Gradle. I love do, doing stuff with Gradle. Uh, everything I showed uh, requires a, a tiny bit of Gradle configuration. So if you want to publish a library, you have to set up Docker, BCV, publishing. Uh, you have to comply with configuration cache and now project isolation and so on. So I believe uh, if you like to solve problems and build tools, there are a lot of things to do in that space. So don't be a stranger. <laughs> Contribute. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, good channels in the Kotlin Slang Slack to do so. Uh, there is even a channel for naming uh, with a, a lot of uh, nice discussions. A few takeaways before uh, I leave. Um, few, uh, we have a bunch of resources, API guidelines, uh, use them, a Vanic text plugin, BCV, and the best resource you have is the community. This is how we will build the best practice for the next 25 years. Remember, you can never love your library too much. And I hope to see you all in 2049 to see the progress and the graduation of all our Kotlin libraries. With that, thank you very much, and don't forget to vote. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? One question? Two questions. Hey. First, thanks for the presentation. Um, so, as a consumer, as a producer or developer of libraries, sometimes we need to do breaking changes in order to evolve. But in the other end, our consumers don't want us to break. So, what are your key takeaways to us to keep to cope with that? I'm sorry, I'm going to go with, it depends. <laughs> uh, I don't know, like, uh, if you're Guava, for an example, and you have b millions of users, depending on you transitively, uh, I would strongly recommend you to uh, think twice before you do a breaking change. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons why uh, OK, what, what is it? OK HTTP went with a scheme I showed earlier, where you know uh, they do not do breaking change, they just do new names, so they change the package name, and you can have OKHTTP3 and OKHTTP2 running at the same time, so this is uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, but if your library doesn't have a huge audience, sometimes you also want to ship faster, so sometimes it's OK to break things, you know? And a, a good example for that is uh, maybe uh, Kotlin Native in the early days, like the ecosystem was moving really fast, and uh, there were breaking change, but this is expected at that point. So I guess the answer is, depends on the maturity of your library. OK, thanks. Um, do you have some tips about logging? Alone the GVM is like crazy logback, log4j, Java util logging, and then talking multi-platform. It's just crazy as a library developer, no? Uh, logging, um, there's an excellent article from Jesse Wilson about that, I think it's called event uh, something. I, I, I will share it just after on Twitter, just after this talk. It's called, basically you just put callbacks into your library instead of adding logs. Um, I don't like logs myself because it's just strings, you know, it's not uh, structured data. Uh, so you can, instead, you can provide proper APIs where uh, people can decide then to hook into those APIs 
get events and with structured data, like for an example, a start time, the time it took to do a request, the time it took to pass a JSON response, and then they can decide to log either into log4g or maybe Android logcat or any framework they like. And this is all outside of your control. Does that make any sense? Yeah, thank you. All good? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>